Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Old Paramus Reformed Church. We're so glad that you have come to worship on this second Sunday of Easter. We still have some beautiful Easter flowers. I heard some people think it's a little cold outside, but to me it still feels like spring and beautiful and the sun's out. Some announcements before we begin worship. If you haven't taken a look already, there in the announcements, there's pictures from the Easter in the Park, and just we handed out lots and lots of jelly beans, and it was a good time and occasion. Also, it's hard to believe, but the flea market is coming, and they are accepting donations from within the church and the Women's Guild currently. And then also, tomorrow night in the Fellowship Hall will be consistory at 7.30 p.m., and the congregation is welcome to come to the consistory meeting. And our last announcement, uh, next Saturday, there will be an organ recital for Aaron Looney. He's the winner of the Rodland Scholarship. And it's at Westside Presbyterian Church at 7.30 p.m. next Saturday. There are some flyers in the back if you want to take that information. It should be a wonderful recital. And... Uh, of a, young, of a young college student. So, those are our announcements. Let us now begin worship with our prelude. Please stand and hear our call to worship from Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Amen. Our first hymn is 425, Lord of light, your name outshining. Let us sing to our Lord.
You may be seated. It is Communion Sunday, and as we approach to come to the communion table, we know that we must confess our sins and find new life in Christ. And if we do that, we have that promise of new life. You'll find in our bulletins our prayer of confession. We'll do this in unison. We'll begin with a moment of silence. I'll break the silence by saying, let us pray, and we'll join in together. Let us pray. You have shown yourself to us, O oh God, by word and spirit, with signs and wonders, and flesh and blood. Yet we struggle to live and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive us, enter into our lives, and cast out our fear, so that we may come to trust in you and have life in Jesus' name. Amen. We have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who offered his life and love to save the world from sin. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now hear what our Lord says about the law. You shall love the, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. I now invite you to stand for the passing of the peace. I'll share the peace with you. You'll pass it back with me. And then we'll share it with those on YouTube and Facebook. And then we'll share it together in the congregation. Let the peace of Christ rule in, in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us turn towards the camera, and we'll all together say, Peace of Christ be with you. And now let us pass the peace.
prayer. God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your Spirit, enable us to hear with our ears, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands your word of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. Amen. The New Testament lesson found on page 1697 Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the word of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, o Christ. The Gospel lesson found on pages 1687 and 1687, John 20, 19 through 31. The teachers of the law and the chief priest looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so that they might hand him over to the power and the authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their, de 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 their duplicity and said to them, Show me a Daenerys, whose inscription an image or on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that a man's brother dies and leaves a woman, but no children. The man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. This has been the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Christ. <laughs> Jeff, somehow we got the wrong scripture for the Gospel lesson. So, since I didn't write a sermon for that one, even though it's a wonderful... Scripture. I'm going to reread John, it's supposed to be John 20, 19 through 31. So. But it's always good to hear God's word in all different passages. So here, John 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, 
their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. I had so much fun last week with Alu Alu, I thought we'd do it again. <laughs> and I know you did. And, you know, right after this I'm going to preach, so it helps wake you up. So you don't fall asleep while I'm preaching. You know, I have other motives, I guess. So we sing it together, and then it becomes a call and response, right? The choir, praise ye the Lord, and you're hallelujah, right? And because of Bill, when that happens, you have to stand up. I haven't learned not to listen to him yet, Debbie. You'll have to teach me some lessons. And so... Remember last week, if you weren't here, that's how we're going to do it. And so we'll sing it twice through. competition, and so far the choir is winning, right? It is a competition. That's just how that is. It's Easter season, the second Sunday of Easter, where we celebrate that death has not won, but life has won, where we can say, death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? And thankfully, here in New Jersey, we have beautiful flowering trees. And I know I'm getting older because I drive around and go, oh, that is beautiful. You know, it makes my day to see these blossoms. It is a season of life. It's a season of rejoicing. It is a season of knowing that life has won. In this season, I'm going to ask you a question. Why do people gather? Why do we gather together? What are some reasons we gather? Celebration. For celebration. Friendship. Friendship. Fellowship. God said to. God said to. Thanks, Pat. You got to do what God says. <laughs> <laughs> we gather for communion. We gather to worship. Praise. To praise. We gather 
sit over here. He's a member of the hobbyist. They gather for hobbies, like-minded things, right? We gather for food. You know, back in the day when it was time for dinner, there was a little bell to ring and everyone would run to the house for supper. We gather to sing. We, gather to sing. we have several teachers here, or retired. They gather with students to teach them. We also gather for protection and safety. And this past summer, a lot of you guys know that Danielle and I went to Amsterdam, and one of the things we did, we went to Anne Frank Museum. And you walk through the house where they hid because of being afraid. And they had certain videos. There was a video of other Jewish families wanted to hide with them. And at first, the Frank family said no because they were afraid that they would all get caught. But after thinking about it, they wanted to protect their friends too, so they said yes. Both of our passages today, actually all three of our passages today, are about gathering, in fact. Our Acts and Gospel lesson are the disciples, the Christian community, gathering together. But they gather for different reasons in both. And so, first, let's look at our gospel lesson. The, the disciples are gathered in a locked room because they're afraid. It's probably a good response because they feel like they have lost, right? In Easter, we know that death hasn't won, and we can say, death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? But at this point, the disciples are not there yet. You have to remember, it seems like weeks ago, but we had Palm Sunday, the disciples thought they were winning. They thought good things were coming. And then all of a sudden, it feels like the bottom has fell out. They don't know what to do. They're gathered in a locked room because they're afraid. I imagine Peter is in his mind thinking, man, I denied Jesus three times. A little guilt maybe setting in. Maybe they're talking about Judas. I can't believe Judas betrayed Jesus that way. Some other smart disciples probably, I saw it coming all the time. But they're afraid. They're huddling together. And all of a sudden Jesus comes in and they don't recognize him at first. And we see this interesting way of Jesus bringing them back, really helping them see that life has won. The first thing he does is he gives them peace. Peace be with you. In the Greek, peace really means no war or absence of strife. In the Hebrew, shalom is that idea of wholeness, of your whole life put together. So in this chaos, when they're huddled and they're afraid Jesus brings peace to them and brings wholeness in this chaos. Then he says, see my wounds? He shows them his wounds. I don't know about you, but I always just think of Thomas doing that. But it's all the disciples. They get to see his wounds. And then he gives a peace to them again. That's the rhythm. Peace, wounds, and then peace again. And then, right before he sends them out to do the work they're supposed to be doing, not in locked doors, he breathes on them. <sighs> he resuscitates them. He brings them life back into them. And he sends them out to do the work of God. He says, I have been sent by God, and now I send you in God's name also. He says an interesting thing. He says, if you forgive someone, they will be forgiven. If you don't, they won't. There's a mystery there about how much power do we really have as, as Christians. If you don't forgive someone, they're not going to be forgiven. Have you ever had that weigh on you? This is a call. But he breathes on them and gives them life. It changes their gathering. Well, we hear Jesus leaves, right? And then all of a sudden they're telling Thomas, you really missed it, just for the record. 
Jesus is back, resurrected. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I see. A week later, they're in the locked room again. Did you notice that? They're locked again. They're, they haven't quite gotten there. They locked because they're afraid. They're still afraid. It makes me think, how often do we lock the doors of church to pe keep people out? Have you ever been to a church where they feel the neighborhood's a little scary, so they have the buzzer to get buzzed in? That's a locked door. What are other ways we lock people out? Sometimes with our theology. Our good friend Joanne Van Sent from Friends to Friends, she will list all the ways that church can lock people out because of stairs and obstacles, not the right hearing, um, devices so that they can hear, or large print. There's so many ways we can lock people out. The disciples do it again. But this time, Thomas is with them, and again, Jesus appears to them. It's interesting because we often think of Thomas doubting as a bad thing. In faith, we have doubts, right? But Jesus says, stop doubting, Thomas. And he allows, and he gives Thomas peace, and he also allows Thomas to see his wounds, to put his fingers into his side, to see and we see that even though Jesus conquered the grave, he still has these wounds. And he allows Peter to see that. And then Peter has, or Peter, Thomas, I'm getting a little confused. Thomas, doubting Thomas, not doubting Peter, betraying Peter, doubting Thomas. He allows Thomas to have belief again. It's interesting, though, because with the first disciples, we see a movement of peace, seeing the wounds, peace, and then he breathes on them. We don't see that he breathes on Thomas this time. It reminds me that that first encounter with the disciples when he breathes the Holy Spirit into them, that's a promise for all of us, including Thomas. That new life has come, that the Holy Spirit has come and can resuscitate us to life again. So that's the first gathering of the disciples. Thankfully, we don't just end with the Gospels. We have the book of Acts. Because we begin to see that once again, the disciples, the Christian community, is gathered together. But this time, they're gathered in power and also in this belief of the resurrection. They're proclaiming the resurrection. The very thing they doubted when they first were gathered. No more mentions of locked doors. They're out in the world so it looks like it worked. The Holy Spirit came and breathed upon them. Jesus breathed life into them. And as a resurrected community, they're out sharing the resurrection hope. The NIV has a lot of wonderful things to it. And in, in it, it says that they were of one heart and one mind. I prefer the King James translation where it says of one heart and one soul. Because in the Greek, the word for heart is cardia, cardiac, right? That's where that Greek word comes from. And it means both thinking and feelings. It's the center of a person's life. So they're, yes, heart and mind, they are one. But the word for soul is basically psyche, as in spirit or the inner part of a soul. Really, it's breath. So as Jesus breathed on them, they are now one breath. They're of one mind, soul, and breath working together to share this glory, this good news of the resurrection. They're sharing what they have in common, lifting each other up. And the church is growing at this time. The Easter promise for all of us is that once in a while, the church does need to be resuscitated. But we have the promise of the Holy Spirit to do that. And so, as we gather today, and we gather around this communion table, and we break the bread, and we drink from the cup, let us be reminded that life has won. Let us leave this place with that promise that death has no sting, death has no 
victory, but life has won. Let us share that life and grace with one another. Let us make sure to go out and forgive one another, and including forgiving ourselves. Grace has won. The Easter season's upon us. Life has won. Amen? Amen. Amen.
At this hour, I'd like to call Chuck Jennings up as one of our elders to assist in communion. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation, that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with this same Christ, who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast of love, of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit, who unites us all in one body. So we are to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. All those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are welcome to take communion today. We have passed out our self-contained elements, and in a moment we'll be using those. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our Creator, Almighty and Everlasting God, you created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us this fullness of your love by sent in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup. Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And 
when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now taking our elements and turning to the bread. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Amen. And now turning our elements over to the cup. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Amen. Sunday we gather together and we have our prayer of supplication, our intercessory prayer. Today I will be leading us in a time of silent prayer where I'll prompt us with some, with some words and then we'll pause and pray silently to God and then we'll hear more, expecting the Holy Spirit to come and breathe life into us and breathe life into this world. Let us pray. O Lord our God, creation is so much with us, sights sounds, tastes, fragrances. We pause to give thanks for something in nature that revealed your presence in our lives this week. O oh Lord, our God, you have brought people into our lives. We pause to give thanks for an experience with another person that revealed your presence in our lives this week. O oh Lord our God, we ask for forgiveness for a time this week where we have disturbed or destroyed the peace of another person. We pray for someone who is on our hearts. We pray for forgiveness and our presence revealed in our lives and in this person's life. Lord our God, we pray for a place in the world that is on our hearts that needs your presence. God, we pray for your activity in this world. We pause for you to reveal to us where you are present and you are actively working in this world.
God of grace, thank you for hearing our prayers deep within our souls, for answering them and for your presence in our daily lives. We now lift up the prayer your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is a beautiful hymn about the community. Blessed be the tie that binds. Hymn number 438. Let us sing our praise to God. tired from Easter Sunday last week, including myself. I called Thomas Peter. So I'm just prepping us. This is our Easter response. We're going to have all season long, and we got to do it with gusto. All right? So we'll, let's shake off the rust, shake off the sleeps, and we're going to do this. The, the choral response, the choir will sing first, and then we'll join in the second time. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Believe. Run to the others, joyfully shouting, I have seen the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 